Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this Sunday service for the Church of the Eternally Secure, also known as CES. Uh, today is the first Sunday of the month, and it is our policy that every first Sunday we have communion. So I'm going to ask you right now, if you haven't already done it, get your bread, get your wine, and in a few minutes we'll have communion together. Uh, let's start off, though, by saying hello to the congregation, and let's start with the infamous untwisted sister, Renee. Infamous. Infamous. Hey, you guys. Very happy to see you guys all rainy here today. Uh, but I'm looking forward to it. I always look forward to communion uh, because it's a chance for us to all meditate on the sacrifice of Jesus. And it's important that we stop and do that together. Good to see you. Amen to that. Okay, Brother Ben, the pressure's on you to greet the congregation. Oh, I can't take it. Um, hey, everyone, it's good to be here. I'm also looking forward to the communion. It's been a, a full month, and that's always a special um, occasion. And I'm also looking forward to uh, addressing the questions and fellowshipping with everyone. So good to be here. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, well, um, I do have an announcement to make, and then we'll have prayer, and then uh, some hymns, and then we'll get into the questions. But um, let me see. I did make a note, so I don't forget. Let me see what I said. Um, yeah. Well, I'm going to solicit uh, help from the congregation uh, in the terms of your talents. Uh, you know how important Brother Ben is to our church. Uh, he, he's, he's gifted with technology, and he has uh, donated a lot of time and effort to uh, produce these programs. But as, as talented as Ben is, um, he's not... Um, completely talented in, in every way. Uh, so um, we could use some help with artistic things. And so what I'm going to ask is if there's anybody uh, in the congregation who would be willing to help us, um, I'd love to see some uh, logos, uh, uh, some um, uh, the thumbnails, uh, some icons, things like that, uh, some um, background uh, pictures for uh, the, these, uh, the church channel. And um, I, I think there's three things I'm as asking for. First, we need a person or a persons who ha is talented and able to uh, do these things. Uh, and, but then what we're asking you to do is uh, right away, I'd love to see a sister, uh, Renee's channel, get her, um, uh, it, it, we, we have a, thumbnail, or I guess that's what I should call it, unless you have, I'm not using the right word here, and it's a big letter R with a thorny crown on it, I think. Yeah, there it is right there. Yeah, and that's cool, but, uh, you know, when we coined the phrase for Sister Renee, the untwisted sister, you know, it, it just kind of came out one day, and we I've been repeating it. Renee seems to like it, and it perfectly describes her ministry. So um, I've been imagining for a long time a, a new um, uh, logo or thumbnail or background for her page that would um, picture this untwisting of scriptures. And we've come up with a few ideas, but we need uh, somebody who has the artistic abilities to, to put this concept of untwisting scripture into a some sort of a picture. Uh, also, um, I, for the church channel, uh, and also for my channel, Brother Luke, uh, I would love to have uh, some kind of a background for the homepage so that um, we we can incorporate some kind of artwork that, that, that uses the uh, truisms that we have been uh, promoting. We've got probably 15 or 20 uh, little short phrases that we've um, uh, been uh, highlighting and trying to, you know, generate interest so that people start repeating it and it becomes real popular sayings. So I, I, it's my uh, hope that we can get those things incorporated into some kind of a graphic uh, for uh, the church channel and for uh, my channel, Brother Luke. Uh, and there's probably other things that we could think of where we could use the help of some, an artist. 
So uh, I just ask that uh, if you have the time and uh, interest in, in doing that and the, the talent, uh, please volunteer your services. We, we could really use the help. <clears throat> All right, uh, Renee or Ben, would you like to say anything about that or any other announcements? No, are we live? We are live. Okay. All right. Um, Actually, uh, maybe I'll uh, mention this. Um, this is something we'll be talking about later. But um, they, I I'd be willing to, if someone's interested in hosting these streams, like uh, producing the programs, um, or having you know just as a backup, if nothing else, uh, and you're interested in learning the skill set required to uh, produce. Um, we would be, I would be happy to share what I know about it, what I've learned over the last six months or so with it. Um, so that uh, we could have, you know, again, if, if there's ever a time where I have a, a bad internet connection or can't uh, produce for whatever reason, that we have a, a backup. So if you're interested in that, please email church of the eternally secure at gmail.com. And also, that would be the same uh, email address if you're interested in any artistic um, contribution. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I do see a comment from uh, Lantra Bias McCarroll. Uh, why can't I see? Uh, looks like you're the only one having that problem. So perhaps there's some technical issue with your setup. Uh, is anybody else having a problem with the audio or the video now? Let us know if you if you are. Um, all right, let's let's talk about prayer needs. Uh, uh, I thank Sister Renee for um, issuing a video last night asking for prayer for my family. Uh, yesterday morning, my wife uh, learned that uh, a cousin of hers in back east where her whole family is, um, and she grew up in Connecticut, uh, died yesterday from a suicide. And of course, it's shocking and it's um, very puzzling for everybody. Everybody doesn't know what to think. And, and um, it's always difficult uh, when you lose any loved one, but especially if that's the cause, uh, it's, it's hard to cope with that. So um, I want to thank everybody for the prayers for my wife and, and her family who are, who are grieving over this now. And please continue praying for them to, to, to be able to handle this. Um, all right, Sister Renee, what prayer needs do you want to tell us about? Well, uh, you know, of course, I want to keep you, Brother Luke's family, especially his wife's side of the family. Keep them in prayer. They had a terrible loss uh, uh, yesterday. I also want to lift up Richard Whitmire. He's a longtime viewer. He lost his father last week. I want to pray for his family. I uh, want to continue prayers for Anthony Suarez, who's waiting for a kidney transplant because he's in the hospital with low blood pressure and a high fever, which is a really bad sign for someone that's on dialysis. Uh, so we want to keep him in prayer as well as continuing prayers for him to have a kidney transplant. Um, also, uh, just in general, I would ask for prayers for my family. Uh, always any of us that preach the gospel are under attack, uh, under attack spiritually, but also by those who don't understand the gospel and think we're some kind of uh, promoters of evil uh, and think we use grace as a cloak for iniquity. Uh, it's a common accusation uh, and it can convince the natural mind that what we preach is false but it isn't. We just lift up Jesus and his uh, sacrifice, uh, not man's self-righteousness. So pray for all of us who preach. Uh, in addition, I want to keep praying for Jonathan Hind in the UK. His horrific uh, physical and, and mental issues he has. He is a hemophiliac suffering with cancer, lost his mother and best friend last year and suffers with other mental issues like anxiety disorder, OCD, and so forth. 
So we want to keep him in prayer. He is just struggling. But I'll tell you what, he has never left anything but kind messages. No matter what he's going through, he is always so kind to everyone. Uh, so we want to keep him in prayer as well, as well as all the viewers in general. It's just a time, a climate of fear, and a lot of people are suffering. I, uh, myself and those of us here on this panel, I believe that we're going to do all we can to comfort the believers, to lift them up and edify them and encourage them to find their strength in the Lord. So we will do what we can, uh, but let us all uh, keep these people in prayer, as well as let's lift up Martha Ferrer. She's our beloved sister down in Florida, and she's having health issues and has to work full time at Disney wearing a mask. And she keeps losing, her, getting dizzy where she can't breathe because she's breathing in her own, CO, you know, her, her, her uh, exhaled air. Uh, so she's having a hard time with that. So uh, thank you guys. Sorry it was so long. Well, no need to apologize for that, sister. Uh, uh, Brother Ben, uh, do you see any prayer needs in the chat room? Uh, I see that MG says he still needs a job, so we, we need to lift him up there. And um, other than that, I would just amplify everything you guys both said. I get uh, Amplify those prayers and get behind them. So thanks. Chris Annie too. Did you see that one, Ben? No, I didn't. Sorry, Chris Annie. Uh, oh, yes. Pray for my brother. He's on the road and his phone got cut off. And the last time we talked to him was Friday. He was in the middle of a manic episode. He has schizophrenia. So mm -hmm. definitely uh, let's uh, pray for him. Hmm. Okay. All right, then, um, we're going to take uh, 30 seconds now and ask the congregation to pray for all of these needs now. Hey, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, let me see. We've done, uh, I think we have the hymns following the uh, communion. I always mix that up. Uh, so if, if I'm right, uh, let's go ahead and begin with the communion now. Uh, Sister Renee, go ahead. You, you can begin. Okay. So the first one is here. Uh, days when we do uh, the Lord's Supper, uh, again, we're going to remind everybody this is different than what the Catholics believe. The Catholics believe in transubstantiation. They believe that the, the wine and the bread literally turns into flesh and blood magically. And so you're consuming actual flesh and blood. No first century Jew would have ever believed that. They know that uh, cannibalism and blood drinking is forbidden. Uh, no early church member would have ever believed this mess. That actually comes from Mithraism, comes from paganism, where they believed in eating the body of Osiris or Horus, as well as uh, Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. Uh, you'll see this Babylonian paganism and blood drinking and uh, transubstantiation comes from ancient Babylon. It is not part of the church. But when we do it, we're doing it in remembrance of what Jesus did for us, what his blood did, what his body did. OK, uh, so we are remembering his death till he comes. We're remembering why his blood was shed and why his body was broken for us. With that being said, there is a warning in First Corinthians 11 
about taking or drinking uh, uh, the body and the blood unworthily. I know most of you know this, but there are many prep pastors that are wrongly teaching that examining ourselves to see if we're eating or drinking unworthily means to examine if we have sin in our life. Well, I don't know any of you that don't have sinful flesh. If you're still alive, you still have sinful flesh. So it is it has nothing to do with examining your own self-righteousness to see if you're worthy of his blood. Nobody's worthy of his blood on their own merits. This was the process of eating and drinking being done in an unworthy manner. They were getting drunk and overeating and forsaking the poor. They weren't considering the poor, or thinking of them during this time. So uh they weren't setting this as a sacred event and meditating on what his body was broken for, not discerning the Lord's body and not considering what his blood was shed for. They weren't treating it as sacred and holy and set apart. They were treating it as like a party and uh, were uh, indulging uh, and, and not treating it sacredly as they should. And so the eating and drinking itself was done unworthily. It had nothing to do with themselves. So don't let anybody tell you or keep you. I've seen people not do communion for fear that they're going to be damned because they don't. So they miss out on this wonderful ritual that reminds us to meditate on the Lord's death till he comes. So uh, please don't let anyone twist this up and keep you from uh, communing with the Lord by meditating on what he has done for you in his sacrifice. All right. Uh, we know that his body was broken for our healing and his blood was shed for the remission of our sins. So these are the things we should be meditating on while we do that. With that being said, I'm going to read the warning now so that you can understand it contextually. Warning is in 1 Corinthians 11, 27. Wherefore, Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself or condemnation, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. And so for what cause? For the fact that they were getting drunk, uh, overeating and taking of the Lord's body and blood unworthily, right? Many were sick, so they didn't get their healing. Why? Because they didn't discern the Lord's body was for their healing. And many sleep. So some had even died. So that is what the warning is about. So now we can partake and realize that this is a sacred event and do it with joy and uh and also contemplating what was accomplished for us amen very well said thank you um okay a reading from uh first corinthians chapter 11 and when he had given thanks he break it and said take eat this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Now, different denominations and sects of Christianity have uh, different opinions on communion, what's the use of it today. Uh, 
and to me, it, it's quite obvious. Uh, the, the reason that we do communion is because Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. So we're being faithful to Jesus's command to keep in remembrance. Um, all right. Um, ben or Renee, you want to say anything more before we we'll move on? All right, then. Sorry, I couldn't get to the. I couldn't get back to the singing fast enough. Uh, no, I just, I just want to say, uh, I actually said to an ex-Catholic recently uh, that this may actually help them uh, have security in the sacrifice of Jesus. That if they do this at home, because they're so used to having a priest having to do it. The Lord said we can do this anytime. And whenever I feel distant in fellowship from him, I will do this every day. And it's it's to remind me what he accomplished through his blood being shed and the suffering of his body being broken. And so uh, I think it's a good thing to do to help you really meditate on how complete the victory of Jesus' sacrifice was. So not just when you do it with us, we are allowed to do this whenever we want to be reminded of what Jesus did for us. You're not limited to a church setting or to a priest. You can do it yourself. Okay, amen, very good point. Um, all right, Brother Ben, if you have some uh, hymns for us, uh, let's have some praise and worship music. And let me ask everybody, uh, as you hear these hymns, uh, uh, pray that the Holy Spirit fills you and uh, gives you uh, Holy Spirit power. And, and just go ahead and really think about these hymns and uh, worship the Lord. Okay, Brother Ben. Okay, here we go. Help me, help 
me, Jesus. Hey, I need you. There's a storm and it's raging all around me. Take me away from this pain. Help me, help me. Help me, Jesus. Okay, all right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed those out of that uh, second song. Uh, I've always loved uh, "Fly Away." There's been 
quite a few times in my life where I said, please, I'd just love to fly away right now. I don't know if you've ever felt like that. Uh, and, you know, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. So um, that's what that song's about. Uh, it, that comes, comes a time when we're going to leave this body, this world. And uh, um, for those of us who have this promise of eternal life, uh, this is a good thing. The, the best thing ever. Uh, all right. Uh, I guess we're ready now for the uh, questions. Let's go to question number one. It says, uh, my question comes from something that I recently have struggled with. Uh, stems from a verse I read about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I understand that this can only be done as Jesus was doing miracles and walking the earth. But I've experienced attacks of the enemy putting blasphemous thoughts in my mind. And I feel like my flesh has also been weak in that, that area, like when Paul says, the good that I would, that I don't. The thing that I hate, that I do. I believe God, his Son, and Holy Spirit know how much I love them and that they love me. But I get self-condemnation. I agree when you talk about the new and old man is similar to schizophrenia. I used to have so much fear and couldn't eat and couldn't sleep. Feet would sweat so much. I lost 15 pounds due to self-condemnation until I said, okay, Lord, I can't care about these thoughts anymore. And I just let go of the fear of having one and or fear of saying something that is blasphemous. And I will be trusting that Jesus paid it all, even when I feel like I'm not believing enough, even when I get a thought and over anything I could say. Do you think not only can the enemy throw these thoughts into my mind, but also my flesh, since in, in it dwelleth no good thing? I'm still learning to walk in the Spirit as often as I can and remind myself my identity in Christ and what he paid for includes everything. I remember when Peter rejected Jesus with bad words and the Lord forgave him. I still am learning more and more and learning how to walk in the truth whenever these thoughts come and I feel like my faith is weak or I need to believe more. It helps rid me of the self-condemnation I feel. Thank you for your help. Okay, Sister Renee. Yeah, what comes to me when I hear this kind of stuff, it's a couple of verses, and one is in 1 John. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. But the other one that comes to me is a practical bit of advice from Paul to the Corinthian church. And it's about how we can take these thoughts captive, right? Because there, there is going to be sinful flesh that wars uh, against the spirit. And that's not only in a sinful way, it's also in the ways of our thinking. So I, I, I'm pulling up this one section in Second Corinthians. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And strongholds are bits of thinking that keep us captive to a wrong way. It's A lot of people have religious strongholds. They've been taught that if they're not a good boy, God won't love them. And this stronghold thinking uh, is still there. And so we have to say uh, what God says about us. Uh, and it's really God's word that we rest on that helps us get rid of this wrong thinking. So it says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is 
fulfilled. Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts that he is Christ, let him think this again, that he is Christ. Even so, we are Christ. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord's given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. And that was about correcting them about this guy in the first uh, letter. So, uh, but we are to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And that is to be reminded uh, of what Jesus did and to believe, hey, we've been reconciled to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's opinion and relationship of us has nothing to do with us, but has everything to do with Jesus. Again, it's how worthy is your lamb. So casting down imaginations, the pulling down of strongholds, it's to fight against these uh, religious or legalistic strongholds in our mind that make us think wrong. And again, if our heart condemn us, God's greater than our heart. He understands and knows all things. He knows them that are his. You know this, you know this, but you are in sinful flesh, just like I am. And so we have weapons at our disposal that are not carnal. And we know the word of God is a is a double edged sword. OK, it cuts through. It's the only thing that will cut through. So whenever I have condemning thoughts like that, I I speak the truth. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Worthy is my lamb. I am complete in Christ. I am uh, accepted in the beloved. So you need to get verses that tell you. How God thinks of you now that you're his child and that like a good earthly father, he's greater because if we being evil can give good gifts to our children, how much more does he? So the key here is uh, capturing those thoughts and replacing them with the right thoughts. And that comes from being in the word of God. But we all have this struggle, every one of us. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you, sister. Uh, okay, Brother Ben, what do you say about this? Okay, this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, the fact that she kind of singled out this verse as the thing that plagues her, uh, leads me to believe or suspect that she thinks that, you know, she fears that she might do this, and if someone does it, that um, it's unforgivable. And I want to dispel that as uh, completely false. Um and this, this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit versus one verse that I, in my early walk, I really considered at every angle and because uh, I wanted to put it on my mind too about uh, any um, apprehension or grief or stress I might have over this verse because um, it just seems so strange and out of uh, character for why would God single off this verse? It seems so like this verse, if you do it, it's like, uh, all of Christians will, will have all kinds of opinions about this verse and, and say, oh, well, if you do this, then you can't be saved. And they, I think they use all kinds of sophistry to kind of work around it. And I think if you just, if you follow a consistent hermeneutic in scripture, you'll find that this verse is nothing for a believer to worry about whatsoever, not in the slightest. And um, I could literally go on for about an hour on the things, all the things I discovered about this verse. Um and it really helped me uh, understand the Bible better it, because I dug into it so hard. Um, so I'm not going to go all, all over all those things, uh, the things today uh, of the things I discovered. I'll just give you a quick summary. Uh, and like I said, Renee, what Renee said was, was perfect. Uh, but I just want to give you kind of a, a, a scriptural interpret, interpretation angle on this. And the the first thing, I, so I'll, I'll just quickly go through this. And if you have any questions above and beyond this, Feel free to email the church channel again, and we can cover this much more detail. But a couple things about this verse is one thing that I discovered very early on in the Bible that I thought was extremely peculiar, and I never really heard anyone talk about it, is it was in Exodus 34, verses 5 through 7. I'll just read that real quick. Uh, it, this is where Moses is um, in the, uh, what they call it, the cleft of, of the mountain. He's, uh, he's on, on Mount Sinai. He's like a little cave. And, and God walks, uh, uh, presents himself before him. And he's, the Lord says, Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, 
merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And then you could almost like do a do a dot dot dot. By no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So right there, you see a paradox where he's talking about forgiving sin and iniquity. Well, if to forgive something, that means someone's guilty of something. And so, but and so there's a conflict there. Okay, he says he's not by no means he's going to clear the guilty. He's no by no means is he going to do that. But and the just he just said previously that he forgives iniquity. And what I found is this is a formula you find all through Scripture, repeatedly. In fact, the, I see this in the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, where first comes the grace. God forgives if, if you uh, approach God based on grace. Uh, if you want to be justified before a holy God based on grace, then you have that grace. Uh, you have that goodness, that truth, that long suffering, that mercy. But if you reject that grace. Uh, and you, or if you're blind to that grace, you remain guilty because you're under the law. The law identifies guilt. The law is holy and righteous, but our unfallen nature to it, it can only point out our faults. Uh, as Renee, say, Renee said it multiple times in the Old Testament, it said that the, uh, the law was going to be used as a witness against you, whereas grace, Christ is a, is a witness for you. Because he's your adversary before the Father, because he forgave all your sins. So, um, it, it, it's clearly law language. So again, you see this script, this uh, uh, pattern all through Scripture. Grace comes first, but if you reject that grace, gra and, and then James even says, "Mercy triumphs over judgment," and that's exactly what you're saying here. You're saying mercy comes first; it's above, but below is the 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 uh, the condemnation, and. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is clearly law language, in fact, because it says, um, for example, that uh, he who uh, does not, uh, that he who blasphemes the Holy Spirit is subject to eternal condemnation. That word subject means uh, answerable to. And so that's, if you look up, if you do, if you do uh, a word search in Strong's Concordance for that word subject to, you'll find that that same language is used by Jesus when he says, if your eye causes you sin, uh, it's better to pluck it out. If your hand causes you sin, it's better to pluck it out because uh, if you because that means you're under the law and you're subject to eternal condemnation. But someone who believes in Christ is not subject of uh, the, the law. They're not under the law whatsoever. And the law, again, defines righteousness. There's no law whatsoever. So if there's no law, there's no offense. And if you read the context in Matthew 12, for example, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit occurs in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But Matthew's account is probably the most comprehensive. And if you study that carefully, what you'll see is uh, what they said is the blasphemy means to speak against. And the context tells you exactly how they spoke against because they said he has an unclean spirit. So they explicitly said that Christ had an unclean spirit. But even uttering those words is not going to condemn anyone per se. That it just means that you're under the law. You're, it identifies your guilt under the law because all through Matthew, Christ is trying to show them you're blind to the greater, and the greater is the Spirit. But they 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 uh, only saw uh, the the letter of the law. They didn't see the Spirit of the law. So all through Matthew, you see first where disciples are picking grain on the Sabbath. And Christ said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I'm I'm the fulfillment of the law, essentially. And um, so, again, they were, they were blind to mercy, and all they saw was judgment and condemnation because that's what they loved. They loved judgment and condemnation because it, they didn't think they were subject to it. They thought they were better than everyone else. They didn't think they were sinners. And uh, all they didn't realize, they, they didn't see their need for mercy. So all through, again, Matthew, you see, uh, first, he, 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 the, the scribes and Pharisees, uh, condemn Christ and his disciples for eating on the Sabbath again an act of mercy they they Christ says you didn't understand when David took the showbread unlawfully but again that was that was an act of mercy and again uh, mercy triumphs over judgment uh the queen of Sheba came to see uh Christ I uh, traveled a far distance to, to learn the wisdom of Solomon and uh hear the witness of God yet they Christ was right in front of them and they still would not even hear him then so he repeatedly, you see, Christ is trying to drive home the lesson that 
you're blind. You all you see is the earthly things, and you're blind to spiritual matters. And that's why they said. That's why Christ said it's okay if if you if you blaspheme if you say that Christ is unclean, physically unclean. That's forgivable. Uh, and even the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is forgivable. But if you're blind to the spiritual thing, if you say the Holy Spirit is unclean, well, then that you're by default, you're, the Holy Spirit, all through Scripture talks about the, the Holy Spirit is the agent that cleanses you, regenerates you. Uh, and so to think that that is unclean, uh, it, 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 obviously you can't be saved because you're, you're, you don't think the Holy Spirit is, um, is clean, can clean you. You can you can be clean before a holy God, and so again, all that Christ is saying there is that uh, it, while you remain blaspheming the Holy Spirit, you remain under the law. In fact, Christ even said all th another uh, overarching uh, theme in Matthew is that the the abundance of the heart over, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. So it wasn't just a matter of them uttering the words; it was that that that's that's actually what they believed. They actually believed Christ had unclean spirit. And in fact, Christ says, by your words, you'll be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. Well, we know uh, the word justification in the Bible means essentially for, in most contexts to be declared righteous before God. If you're declared righteous before God, you cannot be condemned because the condemnation is only applicable to those who are unrighteous. So um, the. Uh, so again, th that was uh, they they were uh, they they actually believed these things. They said they were just uttering uh, you know words just to just to uh, that they didn't mean. They actually meant these things. And then also too, right after the uh, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, he he doesn't even say that there were they were eternally condemned at that point. He actually holds out hope that they will change because he says right after that, either make the the tree. Uh, clean or or i forgot what it says exactly I'm, I'm paraphrasing either make the tree clean um or where does it say that i'm sorry but he basically holds out an opportunity to them he says they either make the uh tree clean or unclean so he's basically still holding out an opportunity to them hey unless you be converted you'll know why enter the kingdom of god so it, it's it's just a, a way of saying that uh if you if you die your whole life never believing the holy spirit uh, is uh, is can clean and it is, is of God. Then yes, of course you can't be saved. And I, I truly believe you can uh, 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 commit blasphemy the Holy Spirit today. So if you read the Bible, for example, the, the the Bible is His words are spirit. And if you think the Bible is evil, uh, then you've essentially blasphemed the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't mean that you can't recover from that. It just means that some if you per die, if you live your whole life and never come to faith and believe the Holy Spirit is. Uh, of God, and then then you can't be saved because that the Holy Spirit is what regenerates you. You you need to you need to be uh, in union with the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit indwelling in you. So uh, that's all it's saying. It's just a fancy way of saying that um, if you reject spiritual truth, then yes, you you remain you remain under the law. So uh, again, if you have any questions, I can go over much more detail. I've I've looked at this at every angle and um, have so much more I can say. Uh, but hope that helps. Hmm. Okay, thank you, brother. Well, first, uh, Renee asked me earlier what my shirt say today, so let me show it to everybody here. I think you can see it there. It's a, an Amazing Grace shirt. I hope you like that. Um, and Sister Renee and I have color coordinated our, ourselves with each other. Uh, I'm assuming Ben is wearing the same color. He's got in his little icon here a similar coat that the color's close. So maybe he is making an attempt to be color coordinated with us. All right. The uh, first part of the question about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, uh, we, we've talked about that numerous times. Uh, and even in the question, the questioner explains that they understand this, what this really is. Uh, but for the sake of those people who are listening who haven't heard us, I'll, I'll give you a real short explanation. Uh, there's pretty much two views that I'm familiar with. The view that I uh, thought was most uh, correct, if we if we're going to apply the Bi uh, interpret the Bible according to this rule, um, 
uh, what was the intention of the writer at the time? Were they, what were they trying to convey? Who, who's talking? Who are they talking to? Well, keep it in that context. Well, in that way, I would say that it's impossible for you or me or anybody to actually commit blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Because what you'd have to do is you have to be living at the time of Jesus's ministry and witness him doing miracles and charge him with uh, uh, doing the miracles with the power of Satan rather than the power of the Holy Spirit. Unless you are living at that time frame, I don't see how a person could uh, actually do that today. Um, another popular way of interpreting blasphemy of spirit is the teaching that uh, it's simply unbelief. Um, uh, if you um, if you never believe, that's the unforgivable sin. Uh, uh, but regardless of uh, how you how you uh, interpret that, uh, it doesn't apply to you as a believer. The questioner is a believer. I'm a believer. I think most of the people listening right now are believers. So uh, keeping that in mind, then we don't need to really be wor worried or concerned about this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because we are believers and we couldn't ever go back in time to charge Jesus with uh, having the d demons in him. Um, but the last part of your question is really what interests me the most. Uh, let me take my coat off here. I have to change my clothes many times through the day because of hot flashes. Yeah, you think Renee would have hot flashes, but no, it's I'm the one that gets them. Now, okay. Um, I was wondering how long it was going to be before you had to take the jacket off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I last as long as I could. Okay, so the last part of your question says um, that um, you have these thoughts come in your head. Uh, it says, um, Well, you, you have horrible thoughts coming in your head, and, and uh, I want you to know. Well, there, have you heard this Bible verse that um, misery loves company? Familiar with that one? Well, I, I'm sorry. I don't, misery loves company. Isn't that in the Bible somewhere? I, it should be. That, that's something that, that's similar about those who are quick to mischief, like people to bring them down with them or something okay all right so the the it's not actually a verse but the but the, the principle or concept is, is biblical uh and this is something my mother repeated to me so much as i was growing up that misery loves company uh so if people you know people when they're miserable they want you to be miserable with them it'll make them happy uh and i will tell you that um uh the fact that you've confessed that you have this struggle comforts me in that same way because I have had these same struggles. And I think that I would like to, to take a poll of the viewers right now. Uh, if you've ever had horrible thoughts come into your mind out of nowhere and you were shocked by it and you say, where in the world did that come from? And you're trying to change your, your mind and get your mind on something else and these thoughts are presenting. You say, where? What, why am I thinking these horrible things? What's wrong with me? Oh, well, you're, you're not alone. I, I, I've had these experiences. It, it, it doesn't happen very often, but when it happens, it shocks me. It really bothers me. Uh, but I want you to know, and I, I, I'm certain of this, that even if you have these thoughts uh, that you're, embarrass you, maybe you're even ashamed of them, uh, you never want to even say it out loud and let anybody know how horrible your thoughts are that's how i could say that about my thoughts uh and yet i know that none of that will uh, is an indication um or, or has an effect on my standing before god so that's the important thing to understand uh, because you have some thoughts that you, you you're shocking you that you don't want to have it doesn't indicate you're not saved and it certainly uh, does not affect how, how God sees you or your 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 standing as a, as a saved believer. So that's the important thing you need to really um, believe that. And don't let yourself get depressed or worry about that. Um, why you have them, um, I'm not so sure, but I, I, 
I read this book many years ago by C.S. Lewis, and it says, um, let me get the right screen up here. It says, uh, the, screw, the Screw Tape Letters. Um, it's a novel, it's a fictional novel about a person that is, um, um, uh, becomes a believer, and, but it's not really about the believer as much as it is the demon world. It's, it, he, C.S. Lewis is, is uh, speculating that in the demonic realm, that there is some kind of hierarchy of, uh, you know, captains of demons and then serving demons. And every person, when they're born, has a demon assigned to them. And the demon's job is to prevent them from ever coming to faith. If they fail in that, it's, it, they're, it, it's a great uh, uh, embarrassment and, and uh, um, failure on the part of the demon. Uh, but then the demon's responsibility becomes, I, now I need to interfere with their growth. I want to make sure, the demons are saying, I want to make sure that they do not grow and produce any fruit and, and become a productive Christian. So this is, uh, of course, what the Bible talks about, the, the spiritual battle that is going on. Uh, so I think that's where it's coming from. Uh, I believe that these things are from the demonic world and they're uh, speaking to you and, and, uh, and it's to bother you. It's to make you question things and to have doubts and, and fears and, and ask questions as you have today. So it is a spiritual battle, but know that uh, regardless of uh, having these thoughts or even how successfully you can cope with them, it does not uh, affect your standing as a saved believer. Uh, all right, uh, Ben or Renee, any more on this question? Amen to that, Luke. Uh, yeah, and I put in the chat room, I have many videos. Just type in Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. About five videos will come up. Is mm -hmm. that yeah. Okay, great. Uh, all right. If there's no more, let's go to question number two. And it says, uh, we see there is a right way to handle people in error. One way that comes to mind is dealing with people in error is Matthew 18, where we try to convince the person privately they are wrong and try to figure out what they are really trying to say. But if they refuse to listen, we only publicly expose them as a last resort. But an argument against that is Matthew 18 uh, is only referring to matters of private fellowship or sin in general. But as far as doctrinal error is concerned, we are meant to handle that differently. They use that the argument that the way to deal with error is to sharply rebuke them, which includes publicly exposing them until they repent. This is because uh, correct doctrine is so important as every single word in the Bible is the word of God, and because all of God's words are life, that's why it's so particularly wicked uh, sin to uh, be teaching wrong doctrine. Uh, is there a different, harsher standard in how we deal with people's teaching error, even in non-essentials, as opposed to dealing with sin among true believers in general? That's a fascinating question. Brother Ben, will you go first on this one? Um, sure. Um, I, I think the, yeah, so I, I noticed that pattern as well in Scripture where um, if the sin is against a, a brother to a brother or a handful of brothers, that you do take it to privately uh, and, and uh, address that person and say, you know, hey, you've sinned against me and uh, we would like you to first stop and ask, you know, try to re seek re reconciliation that way. But there are occurrences I see when um, there, when the when the when the sin is flagrant or against the entire church or very public. Uh, I do see that there that that is kind of bypassed and the sin is confronted publicly uh, uh, as part of everyone. An example of that would be First Corinthians five five, where the uh, brother was uh, having a, a sexual affair with either with his mother or stepmother. Um, uh, Paul didn't say take him aside. It, it, he said, uh, you know, he basically declared in front of all of them that uh, you know uh, excommunicate that man. You know, until he repents. Um, he needs to leave the church, and uh, so they, again, this it was it was a sin that everyone saw. Uh, it, it was it, and, and it affected the whole church really. 
And so for that reason, I don't, I don't, t- I don't think there's a reason to go approach that brother and say, Oh, you know, uh, you've sinned against me. What's the reason? What would be the reason for not, what would be the reason for doing that? I mean, it, everyone knows about it anyways. Um, there's another case in uh, Galatians two where, where Paul confronted Peter because Peter uh, was withdrawing himself from the Gentile believers. So there was a, a schism in the church where the Gentiles were sitting uh uh, at, at certain tables at, away from the the Jewish believers and Peter was uh, condoning that not maybe not so much in words but in actions and uh, Paul confronted him uh, before his, in front of his face he says uh, in front of everyone and and it, uh, again he said he was being uh, he was not being straightforward with the gospel so if someone is is acting uh you know it persists in actions that are that are not straightforward with the gospel or con- inconsistent with the gospel. Again, the gospel teaches that we're all one in Christ. And so if someone's causing division that way for, for reasons uh, that are not, uh, for, for really no, no other reason other than, uh, you know, not doctrinal reasons, but just because they are, uh, they're, 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 uh, they're um, adhering to principles of the flesh and not principles of grace, for example, um, where they're not being straightforward with the gospel in word or deed, um, I think there is an occasion where uh, you need to approach that publicly. And it, it, so especially if there, someone's uh, teaching incorrectly with regards to the, the very nature of the gospel, uh, I think that needs to be confronted uh, in front of everyone um, so that everyone knows what, what the nature of the problem is and to look out for it. Uh, and if someone, again, still doesn't... Uh, doesn't repent, they need to be marked and avoided until they can come to their senses. So, uh, but in general, I, you know, I think it, it, we, we should, we should, that public response should be considered very carefully. Um, and we should approach people in privately. Uh, I think that should be our default position. And only if this sin is really serious, um, again, when they're not being straightforward with the gospel or there's some egregious sin that they're flaunting around, do we need to uh, make it more public? Um, but I know that for me and personally, I, I've had to learn that lesson. I haven't always, I haven't always um, adhered to to what I just said, and so I, uh, I I'm definitely learning, and, and I'm a, I'm a work in progress in that regard. So we just need to be careful as all and consider it, not uh, jump to to conclusions or jump to oh, this is what I'm going to do. I think we need to prayerfully consider what we we are about to do. So that's my answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, Renee, before you answer, just let me uh, talk about the chat room for a second. Uh, we, we've got uh, Christopher. Uh, you're, uh, you're challenging the, um, the way that uh, the um, um, moderators dealt with this problem in the chat room. But uh, Christopher, I'm going to ask you to... Um, go to the beginning of today's program. In fact, it's the beginning of every program we have. And we have a thing that we should put on the screen called uh, uh, CES chat room protocols. These are the rules of conduct uh, during our live programs. And uh, uh, if you read that, you'll understand that we have a uh, protocols to, to follow in terms of dealing with this kind of person and other problems. And the moderators here, who are the deacons of our church, uh, they've dealt with this problem exactly the way the, the protocols dictate. So, and, and what you're doing, Christopher, is violating one of our rules. And that is, if you think that the moderator has erred in some way in, in, in dealing with a problem, uh, that you uh, restrain yourself and don't publicly argue about it, but you uh, talk to us privately about it later, and we can explain to you uh, the reason that, uh, and and figure out if they were right or wrong then. But to challenge the moderator's decision publicly right now, that that is a violation of our rules, Christopher. So uh, it's not the moderator that's erred. It's it's the original person who's uh, said a horrible thing, and that's not something we tolerate, and that's not something we dialogue over uh, right during our church service, uh, and uh, you hopefully understand that now. Okay, Sister Renee, will you, um, will you ask the question? Uh, I wanna address that, but I also, there's a, a teaching moment here. 
it's an immature person. The, the Bible says that uh, it's foolish to to answer a matter before you've heard it. And what I see are people hearing gossip, not investigating whether it's true, and then condemning person for what they believe somebody else has spread the rumor about. And that's how mistakes are made. Uh, our opinions of people in ministry should be based on what they've actually said and how they've treated you personally. Uh, for instance, this accusation that CES promotes apostasy. None of us have ever promoted apostasy. We have fought for the possibility that a saved believer can go into apostasy, but that it doesn't mean that the person was never saved to begin with. It just means that it's possible for a saved believer to go into error after hearing a false teacher. So before we go accusing and attacking people based on gossip, you should actually find out what the person is actually preaching on it. Because a lot of times it's disinformation uh, or the person didn't actually hear what the person said. They assumed they said something that wasn't the case. In this case, it's being purported that uh, we promote apostasy, but we have said over and over again, we don't want anybody to go into apostasy. We don't promote apostasy. We just stand on the possibility that it's possible for a believer to go into apostasy and it doesn't mean they weren't saved. So my thing is before you go uh, attacking people, you should ascertain what they actually said was said. You should see if it's really true if they said that. It's really immature to just hear gossip, no truth to it at all, don't check it out at all, and just start spreading it and telling other people that somebody said something they never said. That's how lies get spread, and it's just wrong. So um, we should confirm these things. Now, as far as biblically dealing with something, now the big issue in the early church, and it's still going on today, is they would corrupt the gospel with the law. They bring either ritual parts of the law or say you got to keep the law of Moses or circumcision or something. And so in Romans 16, when Paul says, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. They're doing it for profit. They want disciples. They want money. They want to be a big guy. These people are legalists. These were Judaizers coming into the early church, coming against the gospel of grace and, and bringing in law. Okay. We know anybody comes into this church and tries to promote law for salvation will be quickly marked and avoided. But we will surely give them the true gospel. Uh, but they shouldn't be teaching anyway if they're, they have another gospel. So, what this issue was was bringing in law instead of the gospel. And so, of course, if somebody tries to say you can be saved by the law or something, you're doing, you should mark and avoid that. We all do that. But we got to understand this is not for non essential stuff like when the rapture is or on eschatology. This is the foundation itself. This is saying if you hear somebody preach another gospel that's contrary to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus alone for your salvation, they need to be marked and avoided. So we need to know what type of people need to be marked and avoided. It's those Judaizers that come in preaching another gospel. Okay. Foundational truths that cannot be corrupted. Things like the divinity of Jesus for one. All right. So let's go over to second Timothy and we're going to look at why we're told to do that. Okay. Now these guys, Hymenaeus and Philetus had told the congregation that they missed the resurrection, that the resurrection had passed already. Okay. If you're doing that, you're also preaching another gospel because the gospel message is because Jesus bodily rose from the dead. You will too. 
Okay, so if they're preaching that the resurrection's passed already, it's a different gospel. It's taken away the hope of their own bodily resurrection. So let's see why they're told uh, uh, and how they deal with this issue. All right, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, he's saying this to Timothy, who is going to be the leader of the church, I believe in Ephesus, if I'm not mistaken. And he says, Done and profane vain babblings, for they will increase into more ungodliness, and their word will eat at doth a canker. Okay, so their word, the false teaching will eat like a canker, and like a canker store inside of your mouth, your tongue constantly goes to it because it, it constantly takes your attention to there, right? And it eats away. So it will take your attention off the truth and the promise of the gospel, and then it will eat away at your faith, your joy, and your peace, right? So this is why we're told to mark and avoid them, all right? Because it eats away at the faith of the church. And it says, who concern, and their word doth eat as a canker of whom, of whom, so there's more than just Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred. So they, they're wrong regarding the truth, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. So, it, and, and ironically, I was fighting for the fact that we believe a person can go into error after they're saved. And here it says, they have overthrown the faith of some. So, uh, again, I believe it's clear that a false teacher can come in and their word eats like a canker. It, it it constantly makes you focus on it. It eats away at your faith. It overthrows your faith. And so whenever somebody comes in with another gospel of legalism or the law or something you're doing, uh, a foundational truth, they have to be marked and avoid it. If they come in with another way, right? Also, if they come in uh, taking away the joy, the peace, and the security of the gospel, which is what Hymenaeus, Philetus, and others like them had done by saying the resurrection had passed already. So it, to keep the church from having being eaten away and tearing up the faith and hurting the joy and the peace and the functionality of the church these guys had to be turned over to Satan. It said right here uh, that they may recover themselves in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So uh, we see a couple of places where they're just like, hey, turn them over to the devil. Uh, if, if they won't address this, they're teaching another gospel and they're stripping away, shipwrecking the faith, they're overthrowing the faith of people, eating away at the foundation that makes the church a strong, uh, powerful entity. Because that's what the church is to do. It's supposed to preach the gospel. It's supposed to pray for the sick. It's There's a lot of things we're supposed to do. And if our faith is eaten away and shipwrecked, we can't work as a strong body. And so that's the purpose of it. It's not to uh, punish, chase down, harass these false teachers. It's to get them away from the uh, having access to the, the foundation of the church, to the believers, so that they can't destroy the faith of those people. And hopefully that God give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth so that they can come back and be a productive part of the body. The, the point here is not to, to harass and destroy the false teachers. It's to keep them from having access to the believers so they cannot tear them down. So ultimately our, our goal is reconciliation and correction, not the destruction of a false teacher. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, sister. All right, I'm gonna answer the question. It, it won't take long, it's a, uh, it's a simple answer I have. 
but but first I, I need to follow up on the, the chat room the problem there just briefly um, Christopher I don't know if you're still listening uh, but uh, the last comment I see from you you said I guess I believe in free speech this would have been a perfect opportunity to change somebody's heart perhaps but instead you blocked him well first of all uh, that's not true he, uh, they were not blocked if you're paying attention you would not say that because that's a false statement and and, and uh, what uh, sister Stacy and sister Heather uh, did was perfect according to the kind of the, the bylaws or the rules of this church and months ago we had meetings to discuss how we want the uh, church to be conducted and establish certain rules of conduct and we publish them and post them before every broadcast and uh, the protocols were followed exactly they were their bad comment was removed because it was hateful and, and uh, uh, accusing and a lie and and it was removed and then uh, there was a follow-up statement by Sister Heather that that uh, um, the um, it was done, uh, and that uh, we we don't we're not going to allow any further uh, hateful remarks like that. So there was a warning issue. This is exactly what the protocol is. And now, if the person persisted again, then the final straw it would be we'd have to remove them. So we've done this exactly the way we want to. And I'm going to ask Christopher and anybody else who thinks that. Uh, what about free speech? We don't have free, free speech here. There's no free speech in church. Tell me what church in America you could go into and you, you're not even a member. You go in there and you stand up in the middle of a church service and you start accusing and calling people's names and, and, and uh, accusing them with false doctrine. No church would allow that free speech in that sense. This is not a place for free speech. This is a place for speaking the doctrines that, uh, that this church is espousing. And uh, if you want to have free speech, then schedule a program where you can have a debate with someone over something. But uh, no, it's, it's, it's insane to think that, that uh, we're going to allow free speech in here. Anybody can come in anytime and say whatever they want. Plus, look, in a way, they've already succeeded in hijacking our program today. This is another thing. We, we don't want to engage the same in the same way that uh, the the people who are now our enemies apparently uh, rather than than just separating going our separate ways uh, uh, they they've decided that now they're enemies and they're going to try to expose and destroy us if possible well we're not going to do the same thing we, we don't speak about it and I, I think it's a mistake in the chat room here for us to get caught up in that. And uh, I'd like to think that we're better than that and that we don't need to respond uh, in, the, in the same way that they are. Uh, so uh, enough, enough of that. Let's stay focused. One of the other rules of the congregation here for our, our services is that we stay on topic. We've gotten off topic. So please, uh, there is a question that needs to be answered. And uh, everybody in the chat room should be focused on that. So I'm going to answer the question simply by saying that Jesus and Paul both established a protocol for dealing with these kinds of problems. And that it, it's simply whether it's sin or whether it's doctrine, I don't think it makes a difference. I think you, 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 if you think that there's a problem, you talk to the person privately. That's exactly the way I deal with these problems. And I think that most of us are trying to do is resolve things that way. Someone contacted me privately a couple of days ago in an email over some charge against me. And but they, instead of just repeating it, they emailed me and asked for an explanation directly. And I, I gave them the explanation and now they're they're satisfied. And, and that's the way it's supposed to be done. You talk to them privately. However, once you do talk to someone privately about whatever the issue is, um, if it can't be resolved, if it's serious that uh, you think it needs to be taken any further, then, then you go to and get two or three witnesses, people who uh, you right, agree that this is a problem and needs to be uh, followed up on. And, and then only then does the whole congregation need to be uh, aware of it. And, and uh, so that is the protocol that Jesus and Paul has laid out in detail for us to follow. So that's what we should be doing. Uh, and I, I just don't think it's a difference whether it's a, a, a sin issue uh, or, or whether it's a doctrinal issue. 
Uh, okay, uh, Renee or Ben, any more on this? Uh, well, just to uh, answer Mike McGregor, uh, he says, can we post the, the chat room protocol um, on our website? Well, we, we broadcast it um, every during prior to every program, the opening sequence of every program. We have that tra protocol. I try to keep it up long, uh, uh, you know, a minute or two. But if you ever need to pause it, read it more carefully, it, it's up there. Um, I think that's probably sufficient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, if you have not read that, if you have not taken the time to read, see, we, we don't just randomly throw up words on the screen before we start our program and just throw out any in, uh, purpose. Everything that we publish there, the, the chat room protocols, the truisms, the verses, there's a reason those were selected and they're, they're, they're there as a foundation for us before we even start our program. Uh, if you haven't taken the time to carefully read what we published there at the beginning of each program, then you're, you're negligent. You really need to take the time to read it carefully, study it, and learn it. And if you think that we're wrong in, in the way that we're conducting this, then you can either uh, uh, talk to us and see if we, we need to make a change, uh, or you can leave and find a place that suits you better. Uh, and by the way, I, I want to remind everybody, this is an actual church service. All right, imagine that uh, I'm a pastor and I'm preaching, I'm lifting up the saints and somebody runs in the room and goes, you guys suck. You teach this. You're a bunch of false preachers. You promote this. Are we going to just say, yay, keep talking? No, we're going to escort them out so that we can finish our church service. And now we've wasted 15 minutes on this. If somebody would just say, click like Heather did and said, we're going to, we didn't even block him. She just shut him down, timed him out. Why? Because the motivation here was to stir up discord and to uh, put accusations in here. That's why. And so when you see this, it is not uh, just a open mic night. Yeah, everybody has a right. I believe in free speech. I let people post comments on my channel that are against me and against what I teach because I want people to be able to answer these objections so that they can have a understanding of the verses they use out of context. I am very slow to block people. But when it's an actual church service going on and somebody comes in with the intent to just disrupt, of course you got to time them out. It's people don't realize what this is. This is for saved people. Now unsaved people are welcome to be here. They're welcome to chat. They are welcome to post questions. But what they're not welcome to do during a church service is disrupted, accuse, and cause trouble. Uh, this is geared towards saved Christians and discussions of Christian topics. That's what this is for. And I just want to remind everybody that's what Sunday's uh, service is for. It's for saved people. And so that is what uh, uh, kind of behavior that you would consider acceptable in a brick and mortar church, the same should be done here. Uh, kindness and consideration. It's fine if you disagree on stuff. That's fine. Uh, but to come in and cause discord like that is not acceptable during the church service. We got to remember what this is. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. The, the, the next question, number three, is, um, is COVID-19 a judgment of God on the world? All right. Uh, Sister Renee, will you go first? I'm trying to see the actual question here. Well, okay. Uh, may, maybe you can post it again, but it's only a few words. Is COVID-19 a judgment of God on the world? Oh my goodness. All right. Well, here's the thing. There is a problem with doing that. Okay. You've got like when the hurricane Katrina came, some people said it was a judgment of God because it's a wicked city. And then I, I heard a priest actually say it was God's grace and mercy because he didn't allow it to happen or let the levees break until such and such. And it saved a lot of lives. So 
Uh, it depends on how you look at it. All right, we know that uh, a lot of bad things have to happen before Jesus comes back. There's going to be pestilence, you know, so there's diseases and earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars and all kinds of stuff that are going to happen before Jesus returns. And these are the beginnings of sorrows, right? Uh, it's the beginning of the end. But to say that somebody got sick and it's God's judgment, that that that's just wrong. If you read the book of Job, uh, it was wrong of them to claim it was God doing it to Job when it wasn't God doing it to Job or that jo uh, Job had done something wrong and therefore God's judgment was on Job. That was a wrong statement. Uh, there's a reason for things sometimes we don't understand, but we're in a fallen world and the flesh is fallen. The whole creation is groaning uh, to be restored to its perfection. So you're going to have diseases, you're going to have uh, uh, wildfires and earthquakes and other things that just happen. If you look in scripture, there's one thing that hit me one time and it said, and the Lord was not in the whirlwind or the storm. So the this storm was going on in uh, the Bible and the Lord wasn't in it. So he hadn't caused it. Uh, we see that when Jesus was in the boat, a, a terrible storm came and tried to prevent him. And I believe that was principalities, demonic principalities, trying to prevent Jesus from coming over to gathering uh, and, and freeing that man possessed of devils. So not everything is a judgment of God. We are in a fallen world. And bad things happen in this fallen world. And I think it's very dangerous for us to start speaking on God's behalf, saying this is God's judgment, when there's so many uh, innocent people being affected by it. Uh, and, you know, not that anybody's good, nobody's good. But I, I think it's very dangerous to do that, you guys. Was the Black Plague a judgment of God? Is cancer a judgment of God? Are all these children dying of leukemia and neuroblastoma because God's got a judgment on them? I mean, this is just dangerous speech, man. I do not speak on behalf of God. And unless God said specifically, hey, folks, I'm bringing this, and he always does it with a warning, by the way. Uh, I'm going to bring this in X amount of time if you don't repent. Then I'd say, yep, God warned us. He said he'd do that. But this hasn't happened. So I, I think it's very dangerous. you got to be careful uh, claiming what's God's judgment and what isn't. We're just a fallen world, and it's going to be messed up until the Lord himself comes and runs it. All right. Good point. Thank you. Uh, Brother Ben, what do you say? I, I don't think it's a judgment from God either. Uh, and Renee brought some great points up. Uh, God does always give his people a warning. Um, so, for example, uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah, for example, uh, 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 Abraham knew that Lot was there. And um, he said that uh, Abraham, knowing God, uh, like we all do, um, he said, far be it from you to condemn the uh, the righteous with the wicked. Uh, so again, he gives them a warning. Uh, he sent his angels to get uh, get his people out first. Um, same with Egypt. He always gave a warning before the plague uh, struck. Uh, I think of another example with Korah's rebellion. He said, uh, get away from the tents of Korah uh, because the, land's gonna, the earth is going to swallow them up essentially. So he gave his people a chance to uh, exit in Revelation. It says, my people come out of her before the destruction of Babylon. So God always gives a warning, um, and he doesn't willy-nilly uh, affect you. Again, like you said, COVID is a worldwide event or uh, threat or uh, plague in some respects. Uh, I, I think it's, it's I think it's exaggerated, but um, it, whether whether you believe that or not, um, I don't. I, again, this this affects everyone. There's no there's nothing we can do to escape it. You know, there's, I, there's no warning, and there's nothing we can do to really escape it other than uh, bunker down in our houses. But even then, uh, you know. That's not something that's you can even then you can't really escape it because you've got uh, you may have children you need to get take to school or 
or uh, you know, you got children coming back from school. There's just no way you can completely isolate. And um, so, yeah, I, I don't see it as a judgment of God whatsoever. I don't. In fact, I don't see really any plague being, uh, you know, except, except for in the tribulation when God, uh, when the uh, seals are, uh, when there's the the plagues are unsealed. Um, I don't see any any further uh, plague per se. Uh, that, that that God's going to be sending. And again, he always gives a warning ahead of time. So I do not see it for that reason. By the way, he reconciled the world to himself through Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Uh, I, I, I just think it's very uh, dangerous uh, to uh, come to conclusions that like this is the judgment of God on the world. Uh, and it's been pretty commonly done, though. Uh, I remember over the years, uh, many famous pastors declaring that there was some natural disaster, and and they're quick to just judge that that, that God did it. God caused it to happen. It's a, a judgment against that city for something. And uh, I, you know, it very well may be that God is is causing some things to happen, and maybe maybe other things that you think God's causing it to happen, He doesn't. I don't know. I can't. I can't make that uh, uh, decision. I, I I think it's a mistake to to make uh, uh, get a dogmatic or, or even uh, be so confident that it's God. In fact, uh, one of the problems with Calvinism um, is that they they take the idea that God is sovereign to an extreme. I call it hyper sovereignty. And they, they believe that everything that happens, God makes it happen. Uh, so uh, this, in every disease, God makes it happen and chooses who he's going to kill with it. Uh, every flood or every uh, hurricane or uh, tidal wave that uh, God is doing it and uh, controlling it. And in fact, they think that God is controlling the movement of every, every atom and every time. God's even controlling every word that just came out of my mouth. Every word that comes out of your mouth, every thought in your head, God is putting those. That's Calvinism. That's hyper sovereignty. The truth is that the sovereignty of God is just that God is sovereign in that he has the power to intervene and impose his will whenever he wants. But instead, the Bible tells us God decided to let us have free will. And, and uh, because of that, uh, the result, of course, is the decisions we make are bad and, and the consequences are bad quite often. And God's there to help us and when we, we call on him. But uh, God's not the cause of evil. Um, so uh, I would caution everybody to uh, conclude that uh, this COVID is a judgment of God and anything else. I would say, though, that from the comments I've seen here, uh, Gia Loves Jesus said something that I think is probably uh, applies to it. And that she says, this is part of the growing pains of childbirth from the world. Now, it's not that God's making it happen, but God did prophesy that there would be, uh, the, as we get closer to the end, bad things will get more intense and closer together, like the birth pains a woman goes through. Uh, so uh, this could very well be part of that. I've never seen anything in my lifetime uh, that compares to this. It's it's the most worldwide uh, plague I've, I've known of. And uh, so it could be that uh, as we get closer to the end of history, that uh, we get more plagues, more serious plagues, and natural disasters, wars, famines, all these things. This is what uh, has, uh, it is written. And since it is written, it's going to happen. All right. I, I agree, Brother Luke. I, I think, if anything, it's just a fulfillment of what God warned about and that these things are going to happen. It shouldn't take anybody by surprise, but it doesn't mean God's doing it. When God does a judgment, it, Ben even went further into this. He made, like he said, he makes the warning. And then it is very clear that God brought the evil upon that nation and that the whole nation knows it was because God had brought it. Well, uh, God's not known to be vague. You know, it, it, there, there's none of this. Uh, the Bible says he reconciled the world to himself through Jesus and no believer is under condemnation. 
So um, I think it's a lot of the Old Testament thinking, you know, and I, I'm so sick of preachers screaming that God's judgment is on America. Like we're one of the worst nations in the world. There's entire nations that are founded on denying Jesus as the son of God. There's at least 15 Islamic nations that hate the real Jesus and on their government building says God has no son. So uh, to say that America is, is the center of God's thinking and judgment is just ridiculous and self-centered, mm. in my opinion. I've been the same thing you know? for years. Hmm. What did I just hear? Um, all right. Um, any, any more, uh, Ben? No, I think we nailed it. Okay. Let's see. Uh, we need to stop right on time today because of our, uh, planned meeting, but, uh, let, let's see the, what the next question is and see if there's time to, to get into that or not. Um, uh, no, this is uh, the fourth question is quite involved. Um, I think the rest of the questions are quite involved. Yeah. Okay. And so we, since we've got uh, uh, like less than 20 minutes left, uh, that should give us time to, to finish up the way we normally like to with a summary, uh, a gospel message, and an exhortation. Um, let me say to the, the chat room, though, if, if there's any... Uh, thing that you want us to talk about as we're closing, uh, put it in all caps, okay? And we'll try to respond to that as we uh, make our closing remarks here. Um, all right, uh, Brother Ben, let's get your uh, uh, closing remark first. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, Ben or, or Renee, or do, do either of you volunteer to do the, uh, the gospel message? I'll always defer to Renee because she's just so much better at it. But uh, if she doesn't want to, I can do it. Sure. I, I don't mind. Just pick one of us. We'll do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Since uh, Renee seems more eager, frankly, so let's let Renee do it. Go ahead. Uh, ben, go ahead. Give us your, uh, well, in your case, if uh, maybe you can include some kind of an exhortation. If you have any encouraging thoughts to, to share with us as you uh uh, I'll make your your summary remarks. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> I'm not good on the spot. Uh, yeah, so I, I enjoyed the um, I, I enjoyed the, the service. Um, really great. The the chat is better than ever. Um, it's really it's it's uh, again it's it, it rivals the panels discussion because it's um you guys are really doing a good job of keeping it on topic, uh, and just keeping it good and edifying uh, and just interesting thoughts. So uh, I enjoyed my time. Uh, today and um, as for exhortations, I my exhortation would just be to um, try to uh, you know don't make it not to be in a legalistic way, but you know it, one of the most uh, super if you want to have a, a supernatural experience, um, get get into the, into the Bible. I mean, uh, sometimes I, I don't even know what I'm going to be looking into, or I might start with one topic and then then just goes off. It, you know couple hours ago by and I not even realize it I'll trace so many different rabbit holes um or not rabbit holes but just I'll find a topic like okay let's study nakedness in the bible what does that mean or uh what let's study I'm going to figure out when does God's wrath uh uh come about what triggers it or when when does God get really upset when is this most severe chastisement come about um those kind of things and I'll I'll uh, I'll keep a notebook um with different tabs which each with each of those things and as I'm reading the Bible, um, I look for ways that, for every verse or, or passage. Like, okay, how can I categorize this? Um, you know, not in a legalistic way or, or overly rigid way, but how can I categorize this uh, topically so that uh, over time, when I need to study a subject, I have a bunch of verses I can look at and then study the context. Um, and so again, that's something I, I love to do. Um, also, when I'm reading the Word, I'll also um, before I take any stance on, on a particular ver a verse, like I know a lot of people, I've, I've seen this a lot lately, where they'll take a verse and make a doctrine out of it, out of one verse. Um, and yet there's other places in the Bible that speak about that very same thing that would 
that will refute that interpretation. And so I, I'm confident every verse, every passage, every teaching has at least two or three witnesses elsewhere. And, and more, more than likely, it's much more than that. But um, there's all kinds of parallels. Uh, for example, I was reading about uh, the, the spiritual gifts in, in Romans 12. And I when we were studying just even last uh, Wednesday about Ephesians 3, uh, we're going to cover this actually uh, next week, I believe, this Wednesday. But there was a parallel passage that you could see it just stands out like a sore thumb. It 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 it, uh, it can you can all kind of overlay them together and get a fuller picture and a better understanding of exactly what the author's intent is. Um, and I love doing that kind of thing. And so whenever I read the the Bible, one great thing I love about the electronic tools that we have, uh, you know, you could always make notes in a paper Bible. That's you know that's good too, but it, I think it's a lot more effective when you can do it electronically because you can search for things. Um, you could copy and paste and, and uh, compare scripture with scripture much more easily. Uh, written, take your own notes in there. And I, I, having done that over the years, um, it's really paying off big time. And the dividends are paying off big time because there are things I forgot, I'll completely forgotten about. And, um, you know, a lot of false teaching in particular, they like to... Uh, they like to throw out verses and, you know, on face value, yes, the verse does seem to be teaching that, but almost, I would say more often than not, it's actually not quite, it, 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 you know, that verse in isolation doesn't, can't be used to, to mean uh, the, in the way they intend. Uh, so the context is so, so important. That's the thing I've, I've learned uh, is context, context, context. Uh, you know, that's like in real estate, location, location, location. And uh, a general rule I use for context is, you know, look in the media context, look in the surrounding paragraphs for uh, evidence of what what exactly uh, that person is saying. So, for example, in First Corinthians, where it says, uh, unless you believe the gospel in vain, well, it doesn't mean your 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 faith was in vain. Uh, it says you believed, you actually believed it. Uh, but how could it be in vain? Well, the author in that a couple sentences later tells you exactly. What, what what he means by vain. He says, our preaching is a vain. Uh, your faith is in vain if Christ had not, has not risen from the dead. Um, so again, the surrounding context is, is the first area to look at, kind of like an onion almost. Like if you look at it, think of a series of rings, the first uh, bubble, if you will, is, is the, the, uh, the surrounding context. Then the next uh, area, if you can't find an answer there, you can expand it out to the full chapter or the full book of the full epistle uh which is i'm confident will, will inform you and then uh if that still doesn't uh give you a clear understanding then you look at the uh the i, I think you should look at that that other authors that that epistle author like if it's a, if it's john's epistle or peter's or paul's epistle look at their other epistles uh and a lot of times because they they each have their own language or own style of writing uh that can be helpful and then if you still can't find anything then you have the whole uh, full counsel of God. So, um, and the other thing too, I would suggest when you're studying is when you read, uh, when you read the Bible, especially the epistle, uh, it's important to understand, or before you come to a verse that's puzzling, look at the verses that were prior to that, because it's precept upon precept. Every, you got to allow the full weight of what was said prior to that sentence to bear on what he's talking about now. Um, because the, in the opening chapters or opening sentence, he'll talk about who he's referring to, what this epistle is going to be about, and then everything else is based on that. Just like any good writer uh, would do that. Certainly God is a good writer. <laughs> um, so, uh, again, yeah, I, I would encourage just everyone to abide in the word. Uh, try to study as often as you can. And don't think of it as a chore. Think of it as a, a, sp a spiritual journey. Um, to me, it's, a, it's, it's the most exhilarating experience you could have uh this side of heaven is is to study his word so um hopefully that encourages you to get back in if that's something you've kind of gotten away from or you know and i think it's important to do it yourself too not just uh watch other youtube videos i know that's can, it, that's not a bad thing uh it's just that i think it's it should be complementary uh or supplementary to what you of your own st study and reasoning and uh prayerful uh consideration of god's word that you you do, you do with him so uh, that's my exhort exhortation this week. It was an excellent exhortation, uh, very encouraging. Uh, so you see, brother, you, you can do that. Right off the top of your head, you came up with something wonderful. Um, I, I would like to add regarding your, 
encouraging the studies of the scriptures. Um, I think if some people are not aware of it, but you've been very unfairly uh, charged with with not being and not studying the Bible. Uh, and and yet I you I believe you've studied it more than most people we know. Uh, you've studied it quite thoroughly. Uh, it's just that there's more than one way to study the Bible. And if you're not aware of this, everybody, that and there's, um, you you can read uh, Genesis one one and then one two and so on through the whole, through to the end, and that's not necessarily studying the Bible. That's just reading it. Studying it is is go, is deeper than reading. And, and uh, if you're going to study it, um, of course you could progress one verse at a time and try to study it. But another way is um, either by character or subject. And uh, I, I've done it all, all those ways. Uh, they working my way through the scriptures one verse at a time over and over again, uh, picking out the most, um, let's say, famous or prominent characters in the Bible and studying them exhaustively, learning about who they are, what they did, and the significance of it, uh, and then choosing a topic like the deity of Christ or eternal security or, you know, any, any subject, there's hundreds of subjects, but picking a subject and studying it from that perspective, trying to learn as much as you can about that subject. There, there is not one way that's better than another. These are just different ways of studying it. I encourage everybody to do all of it. Uh, so yeah, take Ben's uh, advice and study the Bible. He's got some good uh, techniques that he's recommended you use, uh, make, making a notebook, the thing that I regret most in all my years of Bible study is that my Bible here does not have one note in it. I haven't written one word in this Bible. And then when I see people like Bible Jim or or uh, Sister Renee, and I mean, every page, you can open up to any page and there's going to be tons of notes no matter where you open it. Um, I, I just regret that I didn't do that, start doing that 34 years ago. So uh, if you're just beginning, that would be a, uh, something I would advise you to do. Um, so uh, I think that the time today was uh, a great. Uh, and I think that Sister Heather made a, a good comment there in the end that even the disruption that we had to deal with was a good thing in that it gave us an opportunity to bring to everybody's attention that we do have rules. And the rules are not random. They're not the rules of Brother Luke. They're the rules of the Church of the Eternally Secure. These rules were established through uh, several hours of uh, group talks with the, the leaders, of the, the people who are on the panels, the people who are the moderators in the chat room. We, we all we got together a couple of times and discussed how do we want this, these programs to be conducted? What are the rules and our protocols? And then once we agreed upon them, we recorded them and published them. If you haven't read them, then you need to read them. And if there's something in there that you can't tolerate, then maybe this is not the place for you. But there, I think all the rules are there for a reason, and they're reasonable and, and necessary. So, um, yeah. Um, uh, apart from that, uh, let's, Sister Renee, uh, let's, let's hear your summary remarks, and I'm eager to hear your gospel message. You say you're going to use Hebrews, huh? Yep. I, I'm glad uh, the question about COVID was brought up because. Uh, I, I'm really sick of hearing that. I'm really sick of hearing every disaster, everything that happens is we're just waiting for God to pour his wrath on our head when we know that God's wrath was poured out on Jesus and there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ. So um, that was an important question. Also, it's important to uh, determine which ones are to be marked and avoided. It's not everybody that doesn't agree with us. My gosh, you'll never agree with everybody on everything. It was the doctrine that had been brought by Paul, and that is the gospel message. So anybody that's bringing a different gospel, as we marked and avoided, that was about legalism and bringing in the law and circumcision and all like that. So uh, hold on one second, you guys. No, so the dog was having, I didn't want him barking in everybody's ears. And there's people next door at the church, so he's barking. Uh, so the gospel, I like what uh, Dr. Harry Ironside said. The gospel is not you doing your best for Christ. 
The gospel is Christ's best put on your account. And that is the gospel. And I, I brought up here Hebrews chapter 10 because there's so many people trying to bring parts of the law into what saves us. And this clearly, and they also limit the sacrifice of Jesus. Uh, he only pays for past sins or something. This section here proves that his blood goes in both directions because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And no, that would mean the moment you believe you, you can't sin at all or you're going to hell. And when we get saved, we should have peace, joy, and security knowing we have eternal life, not more bondage and fear. It's just horrible that people do that. So I'm going to read Hebrews chapter 10 here. For the law having a shadow. I'm so sorry, you guys. I'm so sorry. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. Okay, we're perfected forever. They were just a temporary covering until Jesus shed his blood. And then he took care of the past sins, the sins before the cross. That doesn't mean the past sins from the moment you believe only. It was saying the sins of the past were the sins before the cross. Uh, and people take that verse out of context, as Ben was saying, context is everything. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that once the worshiper, worshipers were purged, they should have had no more conscience of sin. And, and we shouldn't either. Once purged, his blood purged our sins, and he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. And we should have no more conscience of sins in the sense that they're being held against us or separating us from God. That's what it means. It doesn't mean we're not aware that when we fail, we should be better. It means we don't have conscience of sin on our account anymore. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Now, this implies there is no remembrance of sin because they've been wiped out. For it is not possible that, that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering, thou wouldest not, but a body that thou hast prepared me. That's talking about Jesus. That's uh, prophetic. Uh, I'm going to skip this part because it's about the pro prophetic of him being. All right. Then said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. What is that? The first covenant. All right. The uh, shadow, the animal sacrifices. So he can establish the second, the perfect, the good thing, right? Jesus' sacrifice, the second covenant, the new and better covenant. But it says he taketh away the first. All right. It is not this new covenant is not a mixture of the old. It is completely new. You don't bring parts of the old. Jesus even talked about you can't put new wine in old wine skins. All right. By the which we are will we are sanctified. That means set apart, and made holy through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. This is our permanent positional sanctification. And such were some of you, and you were washed, justified, sanctified. Remember? It's done. Jesus' blood, his offering made you holy. His offering cleansed you. His offering made you righteous. It's only through him. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified we just told you two verses up sanctified by the offering of Jesus Christ's body once for all so he's perfected everyone who has been sanctified by his blood one time for all. This is the covenant I will make 
with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, I will write them. We are keepers of his law. They are in us. All right. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he's consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That part of full assurance of faith and bodies, uh, heart sprinkled from an evil conscience means an evil conscience would be to say that God is still holding sin on our account. That is an evil conscience saying that we have not been reconciled because of his blood that insults his blood. And there's a place down at the bottom that says it's a willful sin to reject the once for all sacrifice of Jesus. And people twist this verse up. For if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Do you see that now? If you willfully sin, let us hold fast to profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. All right. But if you reject Jesus is once for all sacrifice that perfected us forever by which we are sanctified. There remains no more sacrifice to sin. There is no other way. The law, the temple system, remember this is written to Hebrews, the temple system will not accept animal sacrifices. God's not dealing with us through a temple system anymore. There is no more offering for sin because Jesus Christ died one time for all sin. He's not going to accept it. Now, most people twist that and say, if you sin on purpose after you're saved, there remains no more sacrifice of Jesus's blood for your sin. That is the worst eisegesis I have ever heard of that scripture. You cannot out sin the blood of Jesus Christ. He paid for the sin of the whole world. That is saying that uh, Adam, the first Adam, was more powerful than the last Adam, Jesus. The verse is not saying that there is no more sacrifice for sin remaining, that Jesus's blood is no longer uh, cleansing you if you sin on purpose. All sins on purpose. Come on, it's just ridiculous. All right, but I wanted you to see, here is what happens when you will willfully sin by rejecting the finished work of Jesus Christ, you'll have a, a sore punishment. It says here, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. How much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace? So thinking that the law can save, going back to the animal sacrifices in this context, the Hebrew people, the temple system, is trampling the Son of God underfoot. It's calling his blood an unholy thing. It's saying, hey, his blood wasn't good enough to sanctify me or perfect me. I'm going to offer these dirty animals instead. Or I'm going to offer my filthy rags righteousness instead. So you can replace it with anything that you're offering other than the blood of Jesus for your salvation. So I wanted to show you there, people need to see how insulting it is to Jesus to deny that his sacrifice gave us eternal life, to say that sin is still held against us when his blood purged it. Now, anybody that uh, is a true Christian knows that no Christian uses grace as a cloak for iniquity. None of us have ever said, oh, we're under grace, so we're going to sin more so grace may abound. That is an accusation by the unsaved against the gospel. That is calling Christ the minister of sin, and it's an evil accusation. Uh, the Bible addresses this and says, as we are slanderously reported, as some affirm that we say, let us do evil so good may come, whose damnation is just because they speak against the finished work of Jesus 
and accuse the saints. It is only his blood people. And I pray that you understand what an insult it is to say his blood did not perfect us because it did. And that is why we should have our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and a heart in full assurance of faith because we know that our savior saved us and his blood was precious. He perfected us forever. Okay. God bless you guys. Thank you, sister. What a beautiful message. The gospel is so beautiful. All right, everybody. Um, thank you, everybody, for participating today. Uh, the uh, next uh, program uh, for the church is on the same channel, Wednesday night, 930 Eastern Time. It's the Wednesday night Bible study. Make sure you don't miss it. All right. Thanks for participating. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus.